Well, welcome everyone to today's bridge event here at the REL Northeastern Islands. At this time, I'd like to introduce Maria Paz Avery, who is the facilitator for the English Language Learners Alliance, uh, which is the host of today's uh, bridge event. And MP, uh, how are you? Thanks, Peter. I'm here. I'm doing fine. Thanks very much for warming up the audience. Um, welcome, everyone, again. We're very happy to see you all here. Um, Oh, I should get these moved over. Um, we're very happy to see everybody here with the um, webinar that we're holding today on academic trajectories of English language learners and former ELL students. I know this is a topic that has been very much on people's minds uh, these days, um, long-term ELLs and what the impact of uh, reclassification is whether it's early reclassification or later reclassification. So we're very fortunate to have um, the opportunity to present some research on both of these topics. Um, as Peter has mentioned, uh, we will be having a presentation on uh, the two topics that we I just mentioned. Our featured pre presenter is Dr. Rachel Slama. Uh, who is um, a researcher at American Institutes of Research, AIR. Some of you may know it. Um, she graduated from the Harvard Graduate School of Education with an EDD, focusing on educational policy that affects uh, the education of English language learners. And she was a former bilingual teacher in New York City, grades four to five, so she brings a perspective of what happens in the classroom as well as what the research says. We will have some question and answer periods after each of her uh, presentations of each of those studies, and then we will have a discussion, a discuss, our discussion from Carrie Conaway, who is the Associate Commissioner from the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, um, and she will be talking about how the research has informed some of their practices uh, within the Department of Education in helping the schools and districts in Massachusetts. Um, we will uh, do a wrap-up at the end. We'll have a question and answer period with Carrie, and we'll do a wrap-up after that. And we'll do a little bit of a needs assessment to see what challenges you all are facing in the field right now. It's very good to see so many colleagues from our catchment area, sort of Massachusetts, New York, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, and Connecticut. And we're also happy to see so many people from across the country. Um, so our goal for today's webinar is to really bring up your awareness, which you probably already have, but to really see it in terms of what the research is saying around um, the academic achievement of English language learners and former ELL students across five years. And this is a longitudinal study that we will be presenting, and so it's unusual to be able to get that picture of long-term ELLs um, over a period of years. Another goal is to examine the impact of the timing of reclassification on ELL students' academic achievement. And finally, to discuss the implement implementation of both of these studies as um, the results of these studies on both policy and practice and how that impacts the education of ELLs and the academic placement of students with low English proficiency scores. So um, it's, it's a big set of goals, but I think you will find the information that will be presented really interesting. So with that, um, just want to remind you again that you can submit your questions in the chat room on the left. Um, Shai Fuxman, who is the researcher on the ELL Alliance, and myself will be monitoring the chat room. We will be pulling out questions um, to present to Rachel during the question and answer period, but also want you to, to know that um, the uh, questions that we don't get to answer during this webinar will be answered in writing and will be available um, once we have the um, webinar archived and posted on our website. So it's not just uh, what's going to be happening here today, but also uh, we will be continuing to follow up with questions that you have um, posted on the chat room. 
If there are cl clarifying questions that you post on the chat room, we will be direct those to the presenter during the presentation. But other types of substantive questions, we will hold off until we have the question and answer period. So make sure you put your questions up on the chat room. Um, those will be very important. So um, now we want to get down to our presentation. Um, there's a lot to be talked about. And so I will turn this over now to Rachel. Rachel, thank you very much for being here with us. And I know we're all looking forward to hearing uh, what your research is saying. Thank you, MP, for that warm introduction. And good morning, everybody. I um, titled the first part of the presentation, Data, Data Everywhere, um, because No Child Left Behind presented um, us working with English language learners challenges and opportunities, and above all, a sea of data. And many wonder, well, what can we do with all this data, and how can we use this data to directly improve student outcomes for all students? And specifically, today we're going to talk about English language learners. Um, this presentation, I talk about two studies that I conducted using some of this sea of data from available from the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. And uh, most of the work that I present are data that are likely available in your state or district and similar analyses um, with per perhaps some support that could be conducted also in your district or state with English language learners. So I'm going to first define some of the terms that I use here and talk about why this topic is important. U.S.-born English language learners are a growing def demographic across the United States. And in my uh, paper, the first study that I talk about um, U.S.-born students, I would just want to define what I mean by generational status, um, which refers to whether students were U.S.-born or foreign-born. Um, and in the immigration literature, this U.S.-born students, uh, second-generation students, students are typically U.S.-born to at least one immigrant parent, or third-generation are U.S.-born to second-generation parents, um, or foreign-born being born outside of the United States. So just like so that we're on the same page here. They comprise 57% of L's in the United States and 75% of L's in Massachusetts. This is a sizable group. And they're particularly at risk for educational failure, those who've spent many years in US schools without developing uh, sufficient academic language skills to participate in mainstream classrooms. So the other definition I want to uh, throw out is academic English. And um, that's a term that's commonly defined as English typically used in academic settings, such as in school classrooms, in order to acquire knowledge. Um, and it entails mastery of reading, writing, speaking, and listening skills. So this is how I define it in my paper. Now at the high school level, which is the first focus of the first study, L's are at particular risk because they face double the work, as uh, some studies have called this, to catch up to their peers. They have to continue to develop academic English proficiency, and they also have to develop content knowledge. They typically lag behind their peers, and they also um, tend to be in, in high schools that are departmentalized structure. So many secondary schools have few content teachers who are trained to work with L's. High school L's tend to be clustered in high poverty, low performing schools. Now in Massachusetts context, which is um, the setting for this study, they passed in 2002 question two legislation, which was, um, as is popularly termed in the media, uh, in the English only legislation that moved the majority of English language learners out of bilingual programs and into English only programs, um, sheltered English immersion programs. All evaluations of uh, English language learner outcomes after question two have been at the district or school level. So this is really the first statewide anal um, analysis. And as I mentioned before, this, these analyses at the state level have been made possible by No Child Left Behind mandated English proficiency assessments that um, examine academic proficiency in, in, in reading, writing, speaking, and listening. So the key study questions I ask first about what the growth in academic English proficiency are for a cohort of high school English language learners and what those trajectories look like specifically for US-born English language learners who may have spent more time in US classrooms or, and for their foreign-born peers who may have had more time to develop literacy in their home countries. 
So a limitation here that I want to raise is that this is U.S. born is the best proxy that we have for generational status based on the data, but it doesn't include accurate information about the length of time in the U.S. schools. So you could imagine a foreign born student that entered U.S. schools in kindergarten, and alternately, alternatively, you could imagine a U.S. born student that entered in kindergarten but then returned to their home country in the elementary grades. So, um, and then maybe came back to the U.S. in middle school. So this is very complex sample here, um, but this is the best proxy we have for national status. The data is based on the No Child Left Behind mandated assessment, uh, English language proficiency assessment, the MEPA, which I should note, um, Massachusetts has now joined the WIDA consortium, the World Class Instructional Design and Assessment Consortium, so they're no longer using this same assessment, but it is relevant as this change was fairly recent, just last year. And in this study, I use multi-level growth modeling, which is a method that allows us to look at growth over time. So I do follow a cohort of students over time and look at their English proficiency scores from year to year. The cohort is the ninth grade, 2004 ninth grade cohort of all the English language learners in Massachusetts. It's based on, as I mentioned, state level data. And here's a snapshot of what the sample looks like. You'll see that this is, my sample is largely low income, U.S. born, and Spanish speaking, um, which does reflect the demographics uh, U.S. wide to some degree that um, majority of L's tend to be from low income backgrounds. Um, there are slightly fewer Spanish speakers proportionally in Massachusetts. And the ma large majority were enrolled in all English programs, um, as was a result of the question two legislation I mentioned. So the key findings there, that little blue dotted line denotes proficiency on the MEPA. And this, is, this little box here shows initial status. That's what statisticians call when you, sort of the beginning of time that when you're looking at students' data. So you'll see here that the average English language learner is just starting to develop proficiency in ninth grade. And then based on their rate of growth, sorry, let me move that box, the average L only reaches proficiency by the end of 11th grade. So that's where that little red dotted line is. Um, so obviously that there are implications for the fact that many um, English language learners are reaching proficiency only um, in junior year of high school, that brings up many implications, which I'm going to discuss in a minute. But a limitation that should be noted is that we only know, these are the results for students who persisted this far. So unfortunately, we know from the literature that high school L's are at increased risk of dropping out of high school. So those students who, who dropped out would not be included in this later part of the, the sample. So the second question, if you remember from my research questions, asked about these differences in trajectories between U.S. and foreign-born students. So here, um, I just want to take a step back. The dotted line is U.S.-born students. The solid line is for foreign-born students. And again, that's that same blue line, dotted line denoting proficiency. If you look at their initial status or where they started off in terms of proficiency, U.S.-born students do start off um, at significantly higher levels of proficiency than their foreign-born peers. But then if you look at their trajectories um, about when they hit that blue, when they cross that blue proficiency line, based on faster rates of growth, the English language learners um, who are foreign born actually reach proficiency faster than their US born peers. And if you look at those differences at the end of the trajectory, um, which is the end of high school, the foreign born students do outperform their US born peers. So one caveat to keep in mind here, just to put this in perspective, is that we, we might think of this foreign-born adv advantage, um, if you will, that they outperformed their U.S.-born peers. But ultimately, all of these students, all of these L's are reaching proficiency fairly late, and they are likely to still lag far behind their monolingual peers. Um, in mainstream classrooms, so they do remain at risk for educational failure, even despite any relative advantage that we, we could talk about. So here are some of the implications that you can take away from the study. Large percentages of high school L's are U.S. born, 60%. So this really indicates that there are 
a need for academic um, language interventions for this group and resources, targeting resources to promote their literacy and language development, um, both in the traditional classes, and English classes, and also in content area instruction. The next implication, sorry, finding that we can take away is that L start school with low levels of academic English proficiency and don't reach proficiency until fairly late in their trajectory. So future work should um, help L's state, states and districts map out rigorous but realistic plans for promoting L's outcomes. And this can go down to the um, pre-service and in-service level professional development focused on teaching language in the content area and then rigorous evaluations of the effectiveness of, of programs that helps ELs um, pass state exams and, and gain proficiency earlier in their trajectories. And last, this last slide that I mentioned, this relative advantage, um, initial advantage that US-born students have, but then they fall behind. It's important to note still that both groups remain behind their mainstream peers. Um, and I throw out here a future direction for research and also in the district and classroom level that academic ceiling hypothesis um, and that is, is that ELs may reach a certain point in their instruction where they can get by in the classroom, but they're missing some academic language that they need to, they, they get to an intermediate level of proficiency and then have trouble reaching that um, level that allows them to place out of English language learning programs. Um, and this is a, there is starting to be some evidence from other states, Arizona and New York notably, that have large percentage of L's that seem to get stuck at intermediate stages of academic English language development. Um, so there is, uh, is room for that uh, research into that hypothesis. So I'm going to turn it over to the question and answer section before we go into the second part of the presentation. Thank you, Rachel. Um, we have one question, um, which is, at what level of proficiency are students, both US-born and foreign-born, entering high school? So that's a beginning level of proficiency? Yes, I believe so. Yes. So, so what is their level as they're entering um, high school? So is the question here, this spot, what does that correspond to? Is that the question? So the, the average L in this sample is just beginning to develop academic proficiency. So that would be corresponding to a beginner level on the um, Massachusetts English Proficiency Assessment. That's in the aggregate. Yeah. Thanks. Um, and the next question is, um, how exactly did you define foreign-born ELs? Um, was it um, when they were for, when they first arrived in high school, or I'm assuming it's when they were born, anyone who was born outside the United States? Yes, so the Massachusetts um, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education has a database called the Student Information Management System, and it's basically where they collect their demographic information on all students. And there is a one um, variable that they collect, which is country of origin. And students are entered either as being born in the US or other. And if they're other, then they specify which country. Um, so I basically define the group how the state did. Thank you. Um, Another question that we have is, how does this research inform the English-only policy question? Um, I know that um, you'll, you have some implications at the end, but any thoughts about how this research informs English-only policies? Well, unfortunately, one of the limitations of the study is that it, it doesn't, it's a snapshot of uh, the health of high school English language learners, but we unfortunately the way the method methods are set up, this is a descriptive study. This uh, of talking about trajectories over time. It's not what researchers refer to as a causal study, and it's not experimental. I haven't looked at any outcomes uh, or test scores before question two legislation, and I don't compare them to test scores after question two legislation. So unfortunately, I can't conclude, we cannot conclude from this study that 
the students are performing at such low levels because they were moved out of um, English only sorry, because they were moved out of bilingual programs or because of this legislation. In fact, at the onset of this legislation, students were already performing um, at low levels in high school. So this, this study is not, unfortunately, set up to draw any conclusions about the impact of question two, although other researchers have tried to, to draw conclusions about this legislation. Yeah, thanks. Um, the next question is, were you able to see any differences among the foreign-born uh, L students based on the country of origin, or perhaps the language um, they spoke, so the native language? Um, so unfortunately, I did not disaggregate the data by specific country of origin. Um, once you, although I do have a sizable sample because I'm looking at a statewide cohort of English language learners, uh, once you begin to look at different countries of origin and slicing the data, data various ways, the, the samples get smaller and smaller, and that's not something that I investigated based on my research question. Okay, I have a couple more questions about other factors that you may have considered as well. Um, did you look at all at uh, parental involvement or literacy levels? I'm assuming that means the parents' literacy levels as a factor in this analysis? So I, I think that is an excellent question. And un, unfortunately, uh, data at this level is typically, from my understanding, connect, um, collected at the district level and or even at the classroom level. But that is not something that is collected statewide. And you could imagine logistically that may be challenging to collect. But I do think that's very valuable information. And literature has shown that that is a strong predictor of a student um, an English language learner's um, academic outcomes. So I, I, I imagine that if that data were available statewide, it would be very useful. But it hasn't been incorporated here. Okay, and one other uh, factor, um, did you look at um, how long the foreign-born um, students were in the U.S. or how the number of years that they've been in the U.S. Um, impacted their um, proficiency levels? So that is information that, um, so Massachusetts typically correct, collects, um, they used to a number of years ago collect data on the number of years that students were in the U.S. and then that was switched to uh, the number of years that a student was in Massachusetts schools. So I did have challenges, and um, I would have liked to look at that because I do think that is um, important. You'll see the next study deals a lot more with time in the, um, in the US schools in greater detail. But unfortunately, this study does not incorporate that data. And there are some questions, by the way, that um, I think will be answered in the second part of the presentation. So there's some questions I'm skipping intentionally, and we can always revisit those um, at the end of part two. Um, another question um, that was posed in the chat room is, um, can you give us some, more, some information about the type of EL programming that these students are receiving in Massachusetts, especially for those um, who are not from Massachusetts, those members of the audience who are not from Massachusetts? Um, during high school, what, type of, uh, what are some of the typical uh, types of pro uh, ELL programs that these students are receiving? So, <clears throat> so there are documents um, that Massachusetts has available on their website that outlines what kind of instruction, uh, English as a second language uh, instruction, each student receives at each level of proficiency, as well as each level, elementary, middle, and high school. So I think that that question might be best um, answered to our viewers by forwarding some information after the presentation. But I can speak briefly that um, in the high school, there, um, there can be a range of different models depending on the district. And I know there are folks here from Massachusetts districts. What that looks like may be different in, in different districts. It could range from um, a, a push-in support in a mainstream classroom. It could range from a sheltered classroom of all English language learners. And depending on the proficiency level, it could be um, several hours a day or just several hours a week of um, English instruction. So pr again, we're talking about primarily um, English support in English rather than a um, use of the home language. Okay. Um, and do you have any thoughts about how these 
findings um, based on, on other studies or uh, um, what the literature says. How does this study in Massachusetts, um, do you think, reflect on the, on greater, on the general national trends? So I think that there, I should say, have been very few studies that have looked at high school English language learners and uh, particularly generational status. I think this is one of the first evaluations that has done statewide um, examining generational status. But I should also say that, it, that this is consistent with a picture of high risk that this group of high school English language learners um, who, who tend to have low proficiency tend to lag behind their um, mainstream peers in English and mathematics and typically don't catch up um, until the end of high school or if at all. And because of that, uh, unfortunately, that puts them at risk for a broader, um, not being able to meet broader milestones such as enrollment in post-secondary education, graduating, and uh, in, in a, a big picture, this obviously affects um, you know, those who are not high school graduates or college graduates have been linked to lower earnings and higher poverty. So in the very big picture, this is a, a very high risk group that, that should have attention nationally. Um, and I think is beginning to get more attention about how we can intervene earlier in the trajectory of these students. Um, one other question before we move on to the second part of the presentation. Um, the MEPA, the Massachusetts English Proficiency Assessment, looks specifically at English proficiency. Um, how do you think students do in terms of um, their overall academic success? Um, do you think that the trends would be similar in, or the comparison between U.S.-born and, and foreign-born ELL students would be similar, um, not specifically for academic uh, proficiency, uh, sorry, English proficiency, but for other types of academic um, indicators of academic success? So I, have, I haven't specifically in this study, although I think that question will be much better addressed in the second part of the presentation, I haven't specifically looked at performance on content area assessments, which I believe is what you're referring to, on English language arts or mathematics or other, other content area assessments. But because um, I have examined the link between MEPA, um, the Massachusetts English Proficiency Assessment, and the state's uh, content area assessments, which is called the MCAS in Massachusetts, the Massachusetts Comprehensive Assessment System. And there is a strong link. The MEPA is predict has been shown to be predictive of MCAS performance. So I'm guessing that students would, those who perform poorly on the MEPA, would likely also not be at performing at grade level on content area assessments. Now, as to whether there are differences by US or foreign born students, um, there could potentially be differences, but unfortunately, that's not something I have explored here. Okay. Um, so um, we're going to take a break from Q&A for now. We're going to return to the second part of Rachel's presentation. Um, before we do that, however, we do have some um, poll questions that we'd like all of you to answer um, as a way of segueing into the next um, part of this presentation. So as you see on your screen, you have two poll questions. Uh, please answer both. The first one reads, in your state, district, school, what sources of information are considered to determine when to reclassify students from ELS to non-ELS? And you can check all that apply. Um, and the second question asks, in my state, reclassification, reclassification criteria are set by, and you can ch uh, please choose one answer. We just want to get a sense from all of our audience members um, both what are the um, sources of information that are used to determine reclassification as well as who in, this, in the state um, makes the determination. I think it will be interesting to see um, what all of you say. So thank you all for um, responding. Um, just to quickly go over the results, um, it seems like um, in terms of the first poll, one of the key sources of information for all of you, um, for a great, I think over 95% are the scores in English language proficiency assessments. Um, 
similarly to what um, Rachel used in her first study, um, it seems that also scores in state content area assessments, um, grades, and teacher recommendations are also considered to be important. Um, on the other hand, um, in terms of the second question, in terms of who sets the reclassification criteria that all of you use, um, it seems that for the most part it's, it is the state, um, or in some other cases it's the district with guidance from the state. So either way, it seems that the state plays an important role in determining those criteria. In some cases, um, the district has a role as well. Um, so we are now going to move on to Rachel's second part of the presentation, which actually deals exactly um, And um, at the end of the second part, we'll have more questions. So please do keep typing in your questions in the chat area, and we'll revisit them. Any questions that we don't get to right now, we will um, ask. Uh, Dr. Slama to uh, address through by writing, and we'll send the email to everyone who registered to this presentation. So either way, we'll try to um, get all your answers to questions. Uh, Rachel, please uh, go on with the second part of your presentation. Okay, thank you. Um, so the second presentation is also, just to not confuse anybody, also with Massachusetts English language learners, but this is with a new sample of students, and I will get in into in more detail who these students are. Um, but I entitled this presentation, Whether and When Els Are Reclassified. The weather, because I did find in my study, just to preview some of the findings, that some Els do spend most of their school trajectories in the language learning programs without being reclassified at all. Um, and this, this study comes uh, very logically for me from the prior study because of the finding that in the previous study that the high school of high school else the majority were US born which led me to ask uh, whether and when students are reclassified those that enter in kindergarten in particular in in this study I demonstrate how longitudinal analyses are a promising means of improving accountability for else um, because we're, we can monitor student outcomes now with the availability of of new data over time, and particularly after reclassification, um, when they become former L's, or when they're reclassified as fluent English proficient. So why is this topic important, um, the topic of reclassification, and whether the spe specifically the question of whether and when? So federal and state law mandate appropriate instructional uh, assessment of L's, as we mentioned before, with no child left behind, and then that those assessments be then used to make appropriate placement decisions. Um, in addition, reclassification decisions have implications for accountability um, because of the implications for state and re federal resource allocation, that the curricula and standards that students can access, whether they're, they're classified as L or not, and then how they are assessed, which tests are they going to take based on their classification. So, what these accountability measures mean is that schools and districts might have incentives to prematurely reclassify ELs or, on the contrary, keep them classified as ELs longer than, than may be necessary. And I'm going to get into what I mean by that. One more note about that incentive. So many scholars have talked about this contradictory incentives that schools and districts have to reclassify English language learners um, under Title I many, it might provide an, an incentive not to reclassify the strongest performing L's, even if they demonstrate proficiency, because in the aggregate, L's might appear lower, to perform lower, and the district might fail to meet adequate yearly progress. Um, note now that since this has been identified as a, a problem, states can now include reclassified students in AYP for up to two years with adequate yearly progress. Um, so in terms of the contradictory incentive, on the other hand, Title III might provide an incentive to reclassify ELs prematurely so that districts could demonstrate that a greater number of ELs have reached proficiency. So policy makers have typically, historically, seen high reclassification rates as, as a measure of effectiveness of a district's program. Um, so the, there are a lot of complex in accountability incentives that are going into reclassification um, in addition to all the other measures that we use to make decisions about how to reclassify students, as, as the participants noted in the poll. 
Now, reach classified students must achieve academic parity with their mainstream peers. That sounds probably a fairly obvious statement, but this is something that has been mandated by um, the Constitution and by uh, federal uh, guidance. In, in a 1991 memo, um, which was a policy update to a Supreme Court case, Castaneda versus Pickard, which outli outlined the precedent that all English language learner programs should be based on sound educational theory, should have enough resources to implement them, which unfortunately sometimes, as we all know, may not be the case. And then there must be evaluations to show that the program has been effective. So in this memo that came from the federal government, that there was a specific mention that English language learners, after reclassification, must be able to access the same curriculum as their mainstream peers. And then this should be measured by a similar dropout and retention rates. That means there shouldn't be higher proportions of English language learners that are dropping out of school or being retained. And another thing to note about this memo that came from the federal government was that, and this is a quote I'm going to read that's pretty powerful. It says that alternate, alternative programs, or L programs, cannot be dead-end tracks to segregate national origin minority students, which is a reference to English language learners. In other words, Ls cannot remain infinitely, um, they cannot re remain, sorry, indefinitely in L programs without being reclassified. So this topic is important because timing matters. When This is the when question. Re uh, English language learners premature removal of language learning services, or failing to reclassify ELLs um, when they're ready to be reclassified can have a negative impact on their tra academic trajectories. And you can imagine an L student who is, in, in the case of a more separate instructional environment, who is held in an English language program, they may have less interaction with native speakers. They may become marginalized if they remain too long in a separate environment. And there has been some evidence in other studies in, in, in a few districts um, that there is less rigorous instructional environment for L's in an all English um, language learner classroom. And again, this it's complicated to make these assertions because environments are very um, distinct even within one state and even within a district. And last, this topic is important on a federal, on a national level because I mentioned that the Constitution does guarantee English language learners right to a quality instruction that is lined with their level of English language proficiency, timely exit from some pro from such programs, and then access to mainstream curriculum following construction. There have been, uh, more recently, several Department of Justice investigations into schools and districts and, and states that have not been meeting L's rights to, um, um, to all of these criteria. Okay, so this information, um, although it is in one state in the study, it does have a national relevance for those reasons. So the key study questions I asked, based on this kindergarten cohort, what is the average time to reclassification, and then what proportion of the sample is retained in each grade? So again, this is a longitudinal study. It means I follow outcomes over time by linking a student's data from one year to the next, which, as opposed to researchers often call often call um, cross-sectional data, which is looking at slices of data with different groups, student groups. Data sources, this is based on um, two, data, two primary data sources, demographic data, and then English and mathematics content assessment, and then a third source, which is the uh, Massachusetts English proficiency assessment that I noted. The methods used in this study um, are different from the previous study, which was a, a growth modeling study. This study uses a method called discrete time survival analysis, which um, sounds very morbid because that term was borrowed from uh, medical uh, methods that were used to look at outcomes for patients over time. But actually, you can look at time to any event um, based on where students start. So I use this method to look at the time to reclassification, how long it takes students to be reclassified once they enter school in kindergarten. <laughs> 
And as I mentioned, this is based on a cohort of kindergarten English language learners, the 2002 cohort, because that allowed me to look at the maximum number of waves of data over time, demographic information, and then their proficiency data. So this is a table that looks very similar to the prior study. And actually, the, the characteristics of this sample are also similar to the high school sample. You'll notice that the majority of this group is low income, US born, and then just over half are Spanish speaking. Now you'll see here in the fourth and fifth rows here that um, three quarters of the sample were reclassified during the first seven years. Um, and then a quarter of the sample was never reclassified during that time period. And the overwhelming majority, nearly 80%, attended school in an urban district. So this is similar to um, national trends where English language learners tend to be clustered in urban districts and often in, in only several districts in a state. So for those of you who are from Massachusetts, um, in this sample, the majority of the L's were in just five of the largest districts, which were um, Boston, Worcester, Lowell, Springfield, and Lawrence. So the, the bigger picture for those of you who are not from the Massachusetts area is that although Massachusetts may have relatively fewer English language learners compared to other big ELL states, um, they are similar demographically in that they're largely Spanish-speaking, US-born, and from low-income backgrounds. And um, most notably that they tend to be concentrated in urban districts with large proportions of other English language learner, minority, and low-income students. And so here's just a little visual representation of, of that last fact that I told you, that this, the black bars rep represent my sample, the gray bars represent the state, and each individual category is, is the proportion of um, the composition of the average L student school. So the average L in my sample attends a school that has large percentages of language minority learners, which are all second language learners, um, large proportion of low-income students, and large, um, largely in attending urban schools compared to even the state. So this is what's called a survivor function. Um, it looks kind of almost the reverse of what the last picture that you saw. So this graph can tell us the green line that you see that's at the 0.5, the, the horizontal line. That tells us when the majority, when 50% of the sample has experienced the event that you're talking about. So in my case, I'm talking about reclassification. So that point, you can then draw a vertical line down and see where it hits the x-axis and say when did majority of the sample experience reclassification. And you can see by looking at where these little arrows are that the majority of Massachusetts L's are reclassified since after entry into kindergarten um, just after three years, so or by third grade. So just to give you a little context on this, that um, estimates in, there have been many other studies that have attempted to, to use also survival analyses to look at time to reclassification. And I should take a step back and say that one of the advantage of using survival analyses is that it accounts for mobile students or students that may leave your state or may leave your district, which sometimes tend to be the more high-risk students. You, you account for that mobility using this method. Um, in California, a, an evaluation of Proposition 227, which was their English-only um, legislation, found that after 10 years in U.S. schools, fewer than half of L's were reclassified. So typically, in California, students were remaining a long time. So it seems that compared to at least California, Massachusetts L's seem to be exiting fairly quickly. Um, and as I'm going to talk about further in the presentation, this should be taken with caution, however. Um, just to give you a more of a language um, acquisition context, for many years, researchers thought that it would take about three to five years for a young English language learner to become proficient in conversational English, or what's often been termed the, the playground English, used to talk to friends and have a conversation, but even longer to develop that academic language that we discussed, that the, the English that's required to be successful in the classroom. 
um, was estimated to take four to seven years for, to develop, and even longer, about six to eight years for those who immigrated later in middle school or as teenagers. Um, however, some more recent estimates suggest uh, a much more um, stark picture that some elves may never catch up to their native peers, even despite being born in the United States. So there's my however. Um, so the next thing I did after looking at the average time to reclassification, I wanted to know, well, since we have the data on those who are reclassified, because I've followed this group of students over time, how are they doing after they're reclassified as former, um, as fluent English proficient on their, on the state content assessments, the MCAS, in English language arts and in mathematics? And how does that compare to the mainstream peers, the non-L group? So you see here that in fifth grade, less than half of the reclassified students were proficient in reading and mathematics, although they had been exited from L programs in third grade. And that compares to 64%, 54% of their non, of their mainstream peers. So they are still lagging behind mainstream peers, even though they have been exited in the early elementary grades. And then if you look at that same group, which we, again, this is based on longitudinal data, so I am following the same group of students over time. So a few years later, when that group is in seventh grade, the gap widens, and, and only 61% and 46% um, are, are um, proficient in English language arts and mathematics. And that's compared to 74 and 55% of the non-L groups. So you can see here that the, the gap is widening. And then if you remember, that second qu research question had asked about retention. So what proportion of the sample is retained in grade at all during their kindergarten to seventh grade trajectory? Um, and I found that when you link the data over time and ask who was re retained at all in one, in one grade, about 22% of the sample had been retained at least once. Um, and the national average for L's is about 10%, 10 percent of Ls are, are retained in grades. So when you look at this data over time, uh, a very different picture emerges about the performance of former English language learners. So the big takeaway from this study um, of, of, again, a, it's a kindergarten cohort of English language learners. They were followed for eight years over time. Uh, you can see their academic outcomes after reclassification when they're former English language learners. And the big takeaway is that they are reclassified relatively quickly compared to some other estimates in some other states, but the majority do experience later academic difficulties. So this clearly has um, large implications for the field and also for policy practice research. So some of those implications. Well, other studies have examined similar patterns um, in reading, not, not academic English proficiency per se, but have, have looked at um, a widening gap and have shown that among language minority learners, which is not exactly the same group as English language learners, but um, it's the closest parallel we have, that they tend to perform on par in, in word reading in the early elementary years. Um, but then in upper elementary and middle school years, that they tend to lag behind their peers. And this, a, a lot of scholars have hypothesized that this is because word reading may come fairly easily and, and for English language learners, but then the greater, more challenging skills to develop, such as vocabulary and comprehension that are associated with uh, middle school and high school success, are, are more challenging to, to obtain for this group of students. So the fact that students in my sample are struggling to perform mainstream work in English um, following reclassification, it suggests that some of this might be occurring. And it also suggests that reclassification in and of itself is not necessarily a good predictor of students' ability to perform mainstream work. So there might need to be some reexamination of how reclassification is used. And if you remember, I mentioned that um, reclassification has historically been seen as, a, as a, an indicator of a good program because they're exiting a lot of students. Well, this study would show that that is not always necessarily the case because students may be struggling after exit. Um, another big takeaway from this study is that the promise in, in longitudinal monitoring systems 
that a longitudinal monitoring system would much better serve ELS um, than the current accountability system, and, and I'm not the first person to suggest this. Um, many other scholars have been calling for a um, L designation that follows students over time, such as linking data over time, rather than that only lasts typically two years after the students exited. And I, I just want to talk in, in more detail about this difference between longitudinal monitoring and then looking at cross-sectional data, which is just looking at one slice of time for one group of students. Um, so as you saw in, in my study, if you think about the largest group of students in my sample were those nearly more than 50% of the sample that had been reclassified by the end of third grade. Under the current state and, and monitoring system, which I mentioned, would follow them for two years after exit, they, their academic performance would be monitored until the end of fifth grade, so after, from, from third grade when the majority was reclassified. So they might look like they're doing relatively well, but then by the time these students entered the middle grades and academic content becomes more demanding, they've now lost both the ELL label, so they're no longer receiving those services, and they lost their RFEP, or Reclassified Fluent English Proficiency label. So they're not being monitored anymore. And as I showed in, in my study on the slide with the content assessment data, that that gap has widened in middle school. So now they're expected to perform on par with mainstream peers, but they don't have um, the additional support that they need to do so. And my findings would suggest that most of them are ill-prepared to perform on par with mainstream peers. So the, the second piece, uh, the second sort of evidence um, in support of a longitudinal monitoring system is retention. Um, so it, when I looked at retention in each grade level, so how many students are retained in first grade, how many are in, retained in second grade, how many in third grade, this is the, the cross-sectional estimates. It, each what, in each individual bin, it seemed to be within state averages. But then when I looked at data over time, nearly um, you know, one-fifth of the sample, one in five of, of my L's in the sample had been retained in grade. It was double the national estimate. So it's another example of, of how longitudinal um, monitoring is, is very important for a group such as English language learners, as language itself is a dynamic process, as we know. Key takeaways for stakeholders um, that research, uh, future research should focus on long-term L status and levels of academic proficiency and some of the indicators that might contribute to that, such as the, pro the quality of the program that the L is, is receiving support services um, and their level of exposure to mainstream curriculum. And then what, and what uh, accountability incentives might be at play that are leading to either early reclassification or late reclassification. So as I said, another to recap, this study calls is further support for what many scholars have called for as a replacement of the two-year monitoring system and unstable L de definition, where they're either L or not L, and to replace um, this labeling system with a more stable L at school entry type designation. Um, and if that would require additional resources for states to be able to revamp their, their current data management systems in order to monitor student performance over time, which I have done in, in my study. And then last, that districts and schools must have resources available to intervene when, when their students, once they've identified those who remain in L programs um, beyond six years or more, they, or those who are having language-based academic difficulties and they've already been reclassified, they must have the resources available to be able to intervene to change the trajectory of those students. So I think we can probably move to the question and answer for for now. Sure, thank you. This is again Shai Fuchsman, um, ELR researcher, um, with your questions. Um, so we have quite a few. I'll try to get as many as we can, um, and again, the rest we can um, address through email. Um, so first of all, there was a question um, that I just want to comment on. Um, where is the exit criteria for Massachusetts? Uh, Massachusetts has um, recommendations for districts. I believe that in the state districts ultimately make the decision. 
but we will look for um, the document that provides that, uh, that guidance in case people are interested, and we'll include that link um, with our answers. Um, so moving to questions um, for you, um, Rachel. Um, the first question is, in Massachusetts, how long are reclassified students counted um, with L's instead of the aggregate um, data? Uh, is it one or two years? So that, so that would be two years, as far as I'm cons I, I, That's my most updated knowledge is two years. Yeah. So we can um, verify that and, and confirm that. Um, the next question, if most L's are in K through second grade, would it be expected that most of, um, of the reclassification would occur in third grade? So would you expect most L students, since they're coming in at that age, to then be reclassified around third grade? So I just want to make sure that I'm clear on the question. The question was, are, are most people, are most L's enter in early elementary? So is it logical that they would then be reclassified in early elementary? Is that the question? Yes. Um, that's my interpretation of the question. Yes. So I think that's a very complex question as to um, why most students are being reclassified. And I think that would require um, what we call qualitative an, uh, analyses, which is actually going to folks at the district and school level, which is, as we saw from the poll, and, and it would have been my experience, and, and Carrie might speak to more, that reclassification tends to be a very local process. In Massachusetts, there are state guidelines but it's state guidelines for districts, and then ultimately the decision is in the hands of the districts whether that reclassification will occur at the district level or will, will occur at the school level or even at the grade teacher level. So I have talked to many district leaders and, um, about how reclassification decisions are made, and it tends to be a very local process in Massachusetts. So I could make a hypothesis based on the literature that I've read about why third grade, um, but I couldn't say for sure. And to, know, to speak to a hypothesis, it, it could very well be that the third grade year is when students are right before they make a transition from learning to read, what um, Jean Chal, a, a reading expert, once said, uh, which was a very famous uh, saying that a lot of people have discussed, from learning to read to reading to learn, which is where it's exactly this um, dynamic that I discussed where word reading is very important in, in the early elementary grades, and then from reading to learn, which is where vocabulary and comprehension play a much larger role. So if I had to make a hypothesis, I would say that something that might um, come into play is, is the fact that in, in third grade, an English language learner might look very much on par with their uh, mainstream English speaking peers because their word reading would be very um, on grade level. And that's been well documented um, in other studies. And then if you monitor them, the Several years later, their, their way of vocabulary and comprehension, which skills that have typically proved much more challenging to English language learners, when that starts to get very difficult, you've missed the boat in a sense because you've already reclassified them and you have stopped monitoring them. So they're, in a sense, they're sort of passing under the radar as a high-risk group that um, is now having trouble with the new demands of school in, in later elementary, middle, and high school grades. Um, so that's a hypothesis, um, but I think the decisions of actually why third grade is, is probably a local question. Okay. Um, and before we move on, I just want to confirm um, the previous question about when are students considered L's versus included in the um, aggregate data, two years, which is what Rachel said is in fact correct. We were able to confirm that. Um, the next question related to what you were just talking about now, um, is there data showing the performance of those that are still classified as L's beyond third grade compared to those that were reclassified and also compared to non-L's students in terms of their um, academic performance? Um, so let me just turn to that slide. So here's the slide that you're talking about, um, but let maybe uh, Shai maybe could just re-clarify clarify the question. Um, 
So I'm looking at the slide just to make sure I understand the question properly. Um, so our, yeah, so I guess, the, can you, are you able to compare L students um, who haven't been classified, uh, reclassified versus those who, um, who have been reclassified? Okay. I so understand basically, the is there a third column? Yeah. Yes. Um, yes, I am able to do that, and um, and I have done that not for this presentation. It's a very good question. Um, this work, as I mentioned, is um, in an academic paper that's under review. So unfortunately, I can't distribute it quite yet. Um, but if you do look at those same rates, they are um, much lower than. Um, than their reclassified peers, and and that might, you know, given that most um, in Massachusetts and in other states and districts, it seems from the polling, um, most people are relying on content assessments and um, English language proficiency assessments to make reclassification reclassification decisions. It would be logical that those who remain as L are performing even lower than their reclassified peers. So if you added another column um, that had those that remained as L, it, those numbers would be even lower. Um, and when the paper is available, um, we we can uh, you can see the the figures much um, more clearly. Um, and since we are still on the slide, uh, let me ask another question that was posed. Um, can you speak to the discrepancy between reclassified and non-Ls in the performance on third grade math assessment? It seems like the reclassified third grade students score better than the non-Ls in math. So I think that is a very interesting observation. Um, I can make, again, a hypothesis. And there are um, researchers um, that focus on English language learners and math performance who may be better suited to answer the question. But I could make um, a, an assumption that perhaps in third grade that um, mathematics is not as language dependent um, as as other content areas, although they are performing well in English language arts as well. Um, slightly lower, but that difference, 60 to 61 percent proficient um, between on English language arts is probably not statistically significant. So they're essentially performing on par with mainstream peers in English language arts and better in mathematics. So I think that. Um, that would probably be better directed to a, a content expert. Um, it might also come down to the, the same theme that we discussed before, that in, in the early grades, um, that word reading is far less complex. So those uh, English language learners who are strong in math may be able to shine, um, shine a, a bit more in the early grades, whereas in later grades, when problem solving and there are you know, big paragraphs with logic problems that are much more language dependent, even in mathematics, may still pose a challenge in, in later grades. So I can only hypothesize about what is happening that year. Um, thank you. Um, and so along those same lines, the next question, and perhaps you have other hypotheses, um, is it appears that the, at first they perform better, um, referring to the reclassified students, than non-Ls, but then begin to, uh, to lag pretty quickly. Were you able to find any associations, or perhaps you have any um, hypotheses for this decline? Why is there a decline um, after an original, uh, after initial, um, initially performing better compared to the non-Ls? Yeah, I think, um, I, I think that the best explanation for this increasing gap is, again, and I, I'm sorry to seem that I'm repeating myself, but that it's that the language demands, the academic language demands of a middle school classroom and a content area. Um, and in, for many students, this means leaving a more generalist, self-contained classroom in elementary school and now moving into a setting where um, they're going to separate teachers for each instruction. And, and teachers may be um, content specialists, but may not be trained to teach um, modify content for English language learners. Um, I have heard reports that it is much easier for an ELL to get lost in that environment, so to speak, in the middle and high school grades. So pair that structure, that departmentalized structure that I mentioned in my first study, with the more demanding academic content, and um, that could 
be one explanation for this growing divide that you see that, that does seem to increase pretty rapidly in the middle grades. Um, we have only one more minute left for the um, Q&A, so um, let me pick one that might um, not require such a long answer. Um, were you able to look at all at um, ELs who also um, had special needs? Um, was that at all part? Of, were you able to disaggregate those students? That is something that would be possible with this data. And I think that there is a growing um, need for research in this area of dual identification. But uh, that was not part of my study. Okay. Um, so uh, again, thank you, Rachel, um, both for, for the presentation and also for answering the questions. Um, we do have many more questions that I know were not answered, um, so we will um, document those. And as I said before, we'll make sure that you all receive your responses, um, both from um, Rachel's perspective as well as um, from some uh, research that we can do to respond to those questions. Um, I would now like to move on to the next part of the presentation, which is um, having um, our discussant um, provide her response to this presentation and her perspective. Um, we are very fortunate to have Kerry Conaway, who is the Associate Commissioner for Planning, Research, and Delivery Systems in the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Um, Kerry, um, please proceed. Thank you so much for the opportunity to participate today. Um, we, we worked with Rachel to give her the data for these studies, so it's really nice to see them getting out in the um, world for more people to benefit from. I think uh, what, what I want to highlight here is a little bit about how we've used these results at the state and what they mean for state policy. Um, I want to first say that, that I'm the research director, not the ELL director, so I will do my best to, I see some really great questions coming through on the chat about state policy in Massachusetts. I'll do my best to answer, but I may not know all those answers, so um, hopefully we can muddle to, through to find an answer for, for you. I wanted to touch on, um, two main areas where findings like what Rachel has shared have mattered in state policy. One is around our state accountability system, and the other is around the um, professional development and training that we require of teachers who teach these students. In terms of accountability, our state accountability system specifically includes English language learners as one of the subgroups that affect a district or school's accountability level. And to give you the 30-second you know, primer on how this works in Massachusetts, we have a system where we designate schools into one of five levels. Level one is the best. Level five is the worst. That's state receivership. Level three is the bottom 20% of schools. And so we first identify that bottom 20%, take them out of the sample, and then the rest get divided into level one or level two. And you can end up in level one or you can end up in two rather than one. Um, because of your overall performance, but also because of performance of subgroups. So even if, as a whole, your district or school looks pretty good, but you're not doing so well with your English language learners, your special education students, or your low-income students, that can put you into level two. Because we do have a lot of schools in Massachusetts where um, you, there's not a huge percentage of kids that fall into those categories. We don't want to lose track of them just because the, they're sort of being masked by the overall aggregate performance. So um, that's one place where ELL designation matters. Another is that in level three, that's another place where your English language learners alone could be enough to get you into level three if you're in the bottom 20% of, of serving ELLs in terms of their academic performance. So looking at our level three schools, we have about 300 um, statewide. And about one in six is there in part or in whole because of the low performance of their English language learner students. So it really does matter um, in terms of how the ELL students perform in terms of the, the accountability system. So in terms of how we use Rachel's research and, and findings like these, two important ways. One is that we included uh, former English language learners for two years post-exit. This is the question that came up before. Um, we do include the kids for two years after their reclassification to make sure that we're continuing to hold districts and schools accountable for those kids for at least a couple years after their transition. And then um, looking at the high school findings that Rachel presented first, one uh, implication of that is that in this, uh, the index that we use to um, identify who's in what level, we allow 
progress on improving the fifth year graduation, so rather than a four year graduation, you can actually qualify on either. So if a school has a lot of English language learners that maybe need an extra year to get up to proficiency, that's not going to count against them to keep those kids because so they wouldn't count on their four year graduation rate but would count on the five year graduation rate and so long as they're making progress on the five year, that's, um, that counts for our accountability system because we, do, we don't want to give a disincentive to serving those kids. We want to make sure they keep them in school until they're up to the grade level that they need to be. So these kind of findings about the large number of high school English language learners that are, have gone nine, ten years in our system, the reclassification issues that Rachel highlighted really have played into how we set up our accountability system. And we also, um, Rachel's research was one of several factors that led us to recognize that we really had too many students languishing for years in ELL status. And even when they catch up, they perform at relatively low levels. And so here, teaching is really a big lever. If we can help teachers deliver more effective instruction to those students, that will help in improving their outcomes. So several years ago, we started to initiate revisiting our training for teachers of English language learners. We had a statewide program that was an optional, not required program, um, but strongly encouraged and was meant to help improve the teaching skills of core academic teachers. So the folks teaching English language arts, math, social studies, and science, if they had English language learners in their classroom, this curriculum was meant to help improve their skill for addressing those students. But we had done some evaluation work that suggested that the, the program wasn't really meeting the needs of either the teachers or the students. So we'd already started the process of revising it. And then about two years ago, the Department of Justice actually found that our Commonwealth had violated the civil rights of English language learners by failing to require adequate training of the teachers who taught them. So that really accelerated our timeline. We, we were undertaking the work anyway, but now we've really moved much more quickly. We've created a new statewide initiative called Rethinking Equity in Teaching for English Language Learners, or RETEL. Um, and June of last year, we implemented new state regulations around the requirements that those teachers um, have to meet in order to teach those kids. So for teachers that are coming right out of preparation programs now, the training that's needed is, is going to be part of their preparation program starting essentially effective immediately. So the new crop of teachers going into these core subjects will be trained, but we've got a large group of teachers, about 25,000 teachers, who have English language learners in their classrooms but have not they're not right out of a preparation program. So we've developed a course that they need to take um, in order to earn an endorsement on their license that allows them to teach those kids. This course focuses on things like teacher knowledge of how language functions, how children acquire a second language, how to help English language learners access and attain the Common Core standards. And it also goes into the WIDA standards, world class um, instructional design and assistance or assessment, excuse me, design and assessment standards, which are the standards for how ELLs should be taught. And there's an associated assessment called ACCESS. I think Rachel mentioned it. Um, so the course covers all of that content, and we're providing that at no cost to more than 25,000 educators over the course of the next couple of years. So what we're trying to address is the fact that ELL students in the past may not have had an educator trained to deal with their specific needs, which may explain part of what Rachel's seeing here, where we see students that languish into high school still in ELL status. Um, and my understanding is the instructional strategies being taught will help ELLs, but are also good instruction more generally. And I, I know that we have several other people from Massachusetts, including some colleagues from my agency on the line here. You may have much more to say about our successes and our challenges with both how we deal with ELLs in accountability, and how we deal with um, our, the training program we're providing through retail, and I'm very happy to talk about that. Uh, and I just want to conclude by saying that, that I very much appreciate it when researchers make the kind of effort that Rachel has made to ensure that her findings and her research are policy and practice relevant and are disseminated to the field effectively. So I've really appreciated the opportunity to work with Rachel and learn from her work, and also for all of you for listening in today. So I'm happy to take questions or um, whatever else we, we would like to pick up at this point. Uh, thank you, Kerry. Um, so we have questions from people about where they can find more information about the retail program. Um, 
we did just put the link on the chat box. So um, if you do have questions about that, uh, feel free to check that website. Um, I'm trying to see if we have any questions. I'll um, let people have some time to answer those questions, to uh, pose their questions. Um, one question that did come in, uh, do you have any type of teacher certification, or, or what does it involve through this program? Uh, through the retail program, I assume they're talking about? Yeah. Um, it's a, um, the, the course for teachers that are currently teaching kids, it's an endorsement to their license. So it's kind of like an extra thing that says, I'm good to go on teaching English language learners. So it's not a separate certification in the way that the ESL certification is which is a certification to teach English as a second language. So it's more like something you add on to whatever your license is as opposed to a license in and of itself. Okay. Um, another question that just came in, what are the department's plans for evaluating the impact of retail on ELL achievement? Ah, that is an excellent question. Um, and you've asked the research director, which is a great person to ask that question of. So we've already started doing some work just simply observ observing the teaching of the course. So we want to um, keep an eye on, our, is the instruction um, effective? Do we see an improvement in the teacher's understanding of the content before and after? Those sorts of things. And actually, Rachel, you may want to pitch in on this, because I know you've, um, you've worked a little bit on this with us. We are also definitely going to do some work looking at the outcomes on students. We're sort of figuring out what the best way is to fund that and who the right partners are and that kind of work. But um, we will definitely keep an eye on that because we'd, we'd like to know if this program is effective. Um, we'd like to be able to share that nationally. And if it's not effective, we'd like to share it nationally so that we learn from it. Rachel, do you want to add anything on that? Um, I will I'll add a note just from the research perspective of the challenge in evaluating such large-scale programs that, Carrie, you could probably go um, speak to it at length about this as well, um, that I mentioned before uh, just the words descriptive study and causal study, and basically descriptive provides a lot of useful information for the field um, typically, but uh, as my first study talks about trajectories in high school L's, but then somebody asked, well, it, what does this say about the effectiveness of the question two English language only policy? Well, in that same respect, um, analogously retail, we can um, describe it very well, at which will provide a lot of useful information. But to actually evaluate and say that this um, study sorry, this program in and of itself caused student outcomes to improve would require much more complex methods and um, something that researchers called randomized trial, where you actually randomize students to um, and schools to either re receive the retail teachers to receive the retail training or to not to stay as a control and not receive the retail training and then we compare the outcomes this type of research is very very complex in in real world situations when you're dealing with um, complex district policies and school policies. So I think in an ideal world, the, the department, I know, Carrie, you and I have talked about this, would love to conduct a randomized controlled trial um, of, of this kind of program. But I think in reality, it is very challenging to, to do these kind of evaluations. So we have to look to either quasi-experimental techniques where we analyze data and or descriptive data where we um, look at observations and surveys and interviews and this kind of data that can find, uh, provide information to the field. So um, I think that there are big challenges in, involved in, in evaluating a large-scale program such as retail. Thank you both. Um, one other question, um, is there any plans to include some sort of collaborative effort between ESL students and other teachers? in this specific initiative in retail? Um, between ESL teachers and other teachers? Yes. Um, you know, I think that's probably being done at a district level. I've heard anecdotally that um, some districts are either sending their ESL teachers to the training or having them do you know, part of the, because part of the training involves um, going back and implementing the practices in their classrooms. And so involving the ESL teachers, for example, and observing that and providing feedback, that kind of thing. Um, it's not a systematic component of it because our first priority was to make sure we got the core academic teachers who have never been exposed to 
the kind of training that an ESL teacher would have had. Our first priority was to get those core academic teachers up to speed. Um, I just want to remind people that um, if you do have more questions um, for Kerry Conaway, please uh, do type them in the chat box. Um, I think we've answered all the questions so far that um, were posed for Kerry, and we do have a few more minutes. So I'm going to go back to a question that was posed originally to um, Rachel, and perhaps have both of you, um, Rachel and Kerry, um, comment on it, which is a, a broad question and one I know that a lot of people are asking themselves which is how are the Common Core state standards um, going to um, impact um, ELL students? Um, and I guess we can take that question from the perspective of, um, of the study um, involving reclassification and just understanding the long-term trajectory of students uh, of ELLs um, in regards to the Common Core. I can, I can speak a, a little bit to this question, um, and Carrie probably has a much better understanding of Common Core as it plays out at the um, state level. But uh, I think that Common Core standards um, in their rigor and their focus on uh, academic language and content will pose great challenges to ELLs and even greater challenges to the teachers and districts and um, those that are supporting English language learners. And I think that there Teachers will need a lot of support in in adapting their curriculum to 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 make the Common Core standards accessible to ELLs. Um, I know at the American Institute for for Research, which is my organization, um, the organization I work for, is uh, there is some work go that I've been involved with um, to work with states to adapt Common Core standards to adapt curriculum. Um, to scaffold, and when I say adapt, I don't mean to, um, you know, in layman's terms, to dumb it down. That is not the kind of um, adaptation we're talking about. In the field, we talk about something um, called scaffolding curriculum for English language learners, which is to provide additional supports and additional ways of delivering the same content. Um, uh, to meet these rigorous standards. So I do think it will pose big, big challenges for teachers um, to, to help students meet these standards. And there are a lot of opportunities for professional development for teachers um, and a lot of opportunities at, um, I know there are some participants here from higher education. I think there are a lot of opportunities for um, pre-service and, and in-service to help prepare teachers to um, deliver these Common Core standards so that ELLs can access the curriculum. Carrie, any any thoughts about the Common Core and how that Rachel will impact? I think nailed it. You know? I, have, I don't speak curriculum ease, as I say. So I think <laughs> Rachel gave as good of an answer as I would. It's not better. OK. Uh, well, thank you both. Um, first of all, uh, before we proceed, I just want to remind everyone that we do have a survey um, to get your um, feedback about today's webinar. Um, we'd love to get your feedback um, so that we can better plan future w a webinar just like this one. Um, before you leave, please do complete it. In order to complete it, you can, if you look um, below your, near the bottom part of your screen, right in the middle it says, please complete the survey. Um, that box has a link. Click on the link, and you'll be um, taken to the survey. Um, I'll just take a few minutes. Um, I, since um, there doesn't seem to be any more uh, questions at this point, and we're running uh, out of time, I do. I'll. Um, I'll I'd like to um, introduce M MP Avery again, our LL facilitator, to wrap up today's webinar. Thanks, Shai. Thanks, Shai. Um, just so you all know, um, Jennifer did say that um, we will be archiving these proceedings, and there will be a full recording and a transcript, as well as we said, any other questions that were not answered, those will be answered, and those will also be posted. We will be sending out an e email to all the participants to let you know when it is ready. One of the things I wanted to just go back to was an early comment that was made by someone about the need for data that, is, um, that will help us actually answer many of the questions that you raised. One of the things we're finding as we're doing this work through the ELL Alliance is that the data that is available and that is at a finer grain, we have 
good data that is at a very macro level. But when we try to get down to more specifics, like some of the factors that you raised, like at what age did this, a student who is a non-US born student, at what age did they come into the US system? Or Rachel points out in her paper that um, even for US born ELLs, we don't know um, really what amount of time they've actually been in the US system here in the United States, because uh, some of them go back to their home countries for a while and then come back to the US. So there are finer grain kinds of data that we don't have that would help answer those questions. So one of the things we're trying to do as the ELL Alliance for the Northeastern Islands is to work with our state and district people to see how we can get to that finer grain of data so that we can really investigate the kind of questions that you are raising in more detail. Um, the other thing is also to educate those who enter the data as very often when we work with state departments of education and we ask them, um, so what's the data available that we can work with? They, people at the, our departments of ed will say to us, um, really, really there are some things here that you shouldn't use because the accuracy of that data is not very good. So one of our goals is really to try to work with our districts and with our states to try to make sure that the data that we're gathering on ELLs and their trajectory factors that influence their trajectories at both learning English and the content um, is, is at uh, the, the kind of accuracy and reliability that we can use it to answer the questions that you all have been raising. Um, so one of the things we'd like to do before we end this email is to put up another po poll um, that brings up some of the key issues that we have been considering as part of the ELL Alliance. And we'd like to get a sense from you as a participant as to what you think the priorities are, what are the challenges that you're facing in your state or in your district um, around the education of English language learners. So thanks, many of you are filling that out. Um, and we're getting, oh, it keeps changing, um, but it looks like professional development for ELL, on ELL-related issues is uh, of interest, especially professional development for general education teachers. Um, I see that no one is, is actually putting anything down for professional development for administrators, but one of our states has actually asked us to do a survey on what do administrators know or don't know about the education of ELLs, um, because they, especially as we're moving into the era of um, teacher evaluations, and many administrators are evaluating teachers, there really has to be an understanding on their part as to what it means to educate an English language learner. So um, okay, it looks like professional developer that uh, we will be taking that into account as we continue with our research agenda for the English Language Learner Alliance at um, the Regional Educational Lab for the Northeast and Islands. Um, so with that, we are going to conclude our, um, our webinar. Thank you all for staying on and asking the very uh, incisive questions that you have been asking. We will be reviewing this information and making sure that we address those questions that were not answered. Again, I just want to remind you again to please um, fill out our uh, survey, our customer survey. It's very important to us. We pay attention to suggestions that you have, um, that you make, and try to improve uh, more as we move forward with our webinars and bringing information into the field. Um, if you have any direct questions that you would like to send to myself or to Shai or to both of us, we'd be very happy to address those. Um, so again, thank you all very much. Please fill out the survey, and we hope to see you at a future webinar that will be hosted by the English Language Learners Alliance for the REL Northeast and Islands. Thank you. Thank you very much. This concludes today's Bridge event. Learn more about the RHEL and all its activities at RHELNE.org. Bye-bye.